Hi, I'm Matt Reardon from Putnam Associates, part of the Anisio Group of Companies. Uh, really excited to be here in Chicago at ASCO this year. Every year that we're here, we see amazing breakthroughs in cancer care. But something that really stands out to me this year is the uh, advancement in the technologies behind the cancer medicines that are being developed today and the, the full spread of what's out there. It's no longer just antibodies and, and oral therapies, but a full spectrum of radio ligand therapies, CAR T therapies, bispecific therapies, antibody drug conjugates, the list goes on and on. One of the interesting things that uh, I'm sort of keeping an eye on here is how are all these technologies being considered by the full spectrum of uh, practicing oncologists that are here? We have amazing oncologists here from top flight cancer institutions, um, but we also have a lot of clinicians here that come from the community. And one of the most important questions uh, for clinical practice is how do these technologies, especially the more advanced ones that have new modalities, that have new mechanisms of action, that have new ways of administration, new adverse events to monitor, how are they going to be adopted uh, by the, the full spectrum of treating oncologists across, uh, across this country and really across the world? Uh, and that's a really interesting question, something that we're trying to help our clients uh, solve. And it's something that uh, the truth is, if we look back 10, 15 years from now, all of these technologies will be adopted but we have a chance here to bend that curve and have a faster adoption period. If we can find solutions, if we can help educate clinicians faster, if we can help educate patients faster on what to expect. So that's some of the most exciting stuff I'm, uh, I'm here observing, listening to, uh, and really excited to be a part of this weekend. I think there's a, a tremendous amount of different types of services and values that uh, biopharmaceutical companies require to be able to bring these medicines to market. I think Amizio is in an incredible position to help do that across the entire product life cycle, really be the leading commercialization partner that has unique capabilities across advisory, across medical and communications, marketing communications, and about actually going out there and engaging with, uh, with healthcare practitioners. So there's a, a full spectrum there. But I, one of the most important things, especially when we do it and hunt them inside the Amizio advisory group, is that we help companies determine where they want to be 5, 10, 15 years from now in terms of oncology care. What medicines do they need to develop? And that starts with the question of where are the greatest op-med needs? What is going to happen as the medicines that are on the horizon today start to become standards of care? What will be the and op-med needs? And how can we help leverage the help, the uh, scientific acumen that we bring as well as the strategic perspective to provide guidance to these organizations on on where those investments can be best placed, both in terms of the benefits to them as as businesses, but more importantly, benefits that that's going to make to patients and the families uh, that are going to be affecting the cancer uh, over the next several decades. Uh, it's a wonderful question. So in terms of helping our clients navigate complex uh, therapeutics or breakthrough type therapies, it's actually really a core of offering that we have at, at Putnam. Uh, we're really bridge science and strategy. We've got a number of people that come back from PhD and MD backgrounds, as well as people that come from MDA type backgrounds like myself. So I won't admit that I, I have, uh, I will admit that I, I don't have as, as much of a scientific background as, as many of my colleagues. We try and bring a lot of the skill sets together uh, and, you know, understand science first and bridge out from here. So we've had success, whether you're talking about your great medicines here, like radio ligand therapies or five specific antibodies, being able to understand how are those going to be deliver to different sites of care? What do organizations need to do and think differently that it's not just a standard playbook that it needs to get built up every time uh, new we have a new technology out there uh, to make sure that you have post impact or with clinicians and the patients they're serving. There's a a number of, of challenges that I think in terms of the alignment across the different cross functional layer fields, whether that's your commercial team, development teams, your medical teams, your regulatory, your market access, they all have their own objectives. Uh, and the truth is, honestly, there's not nearly enough integration uh, um, across those teams. Uh, and I think most organizations could benefit for having more frequent strategic interaction across those teams. Uh, oftentimes, there's uh, what I might consider a checklist approach that gets utilized where those different functions have a number of checklist items that they're trying to go through that are re related to their functions. What they rarely do well, uh, or as well as it possibly could, is go like, what is the strategy? What are we actually trying to accomplish? And then making sure that the checklist items actually line up to those strategic imperatives, as opposed to just being a checklist of items that they need to capture inside of their uh, specific area of expertise there and domain of work uh, as opposed to integrating into what is the core strategy we have that's going to unlock 
the value of this product to clinicians and patients? Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the one of the areas that we're most proud of at Putnam is we were the principal advisors behind the launch of the very first CAR-T product at Dworld. Uh, and we were involved with that, not just at the launch period, going all the way back into early stage clinical developments or first to human type trials uh, and, and able to shape the strategy of uh, different therapeutic uh, focus areas, including pediatric oncology, including adult oncology, and really steering uh, steering that product you know, in terms of where the clinical development would be, but also what was the go-to-market strategy? How, uh, what tools would need to be developed? What processes would need to be developed to ensure that the product was going to be available for the patients that need it, that clinicians would understand how to complete all the processes of steps for UI. So we're really proud to uh, have been uh, you know, a principal uh, force. Uh, obviously, there's amazing scientists here. There's uh, tremendous biopharmaceutical uh, teams that really did all of the hard work. We were a, a very small portion of it, but we're really proud to have been uh, in a port, the small portion at launch. You know, one of the most common challenges that's facing the uh, pharmaceutical biotechnology manufacturers today is the question of market access and, and how do we uh, how do we ensure innovations that we're bringing uh, have access with payers across the world it often starts with the u.s as a primary focus but also uh, how do we build the evidence how do we develop strategies to ensure that we are getting access and getting access at uh, honestly a fair price a price that's going to be able to uh, drive returns that spur on future innovation. And that's no easy task. It becomes more challenging year over year in every single uh, market. And uh, there's a lot of strategy behind it. It's one of the most common things that we do at Putnam and it's, it's only a, a growing area of need. Um, you know, it goes back to one of the things we were talking about a moment ago. I think a great strategy overall is one that brings together the cross-functional uh, stakeholders and has combined it. And it's obviously a strategy that's going to deliver success that drives uptake, that drives understanding of for both. Institute the institutions that are delivering therapy, the clinicians that are actually administering it, the patients that are receiving it, the caregivers that are supporting those patients. It considers all those consistencies, and then goes back to the organization and make sure that you are considering. You know, what are you doing in your marketing efforts that are going to address the needs? What are you doing in your market access strategy that's going to ensure there's access for it? What are you doing in your medical communication strategy that's going to uh, ensure that that the messages are are finding their way into the uh, the right staple is it, but, but understanding the on just product itself, the marketing side, into understanding the disease and the evolution, the need that's there. A question the clients don't ask us, but wish, wish they could. Uh, you know, I think one uh, uh, a question that we we don't get asked uh, a lot yet is honestly, who is Anisio? Uh You know, Anisio is a pretty new brand out there, and and what's amazing is that Putnam can offer uh, great strategic advice. One of the leading advisory firms in the life sciences. But how do we connect that to other parts, uh, other parts of commercialization process? And we really have a unique ability to bring in other parts of our organization at Anisio to, to help with that. Um, and so if there's a question I wish we got asked more, it would be, you know, how can we connect our services better and really offer a seamless experience uh, where we can translate our strategy into action and draw all the, the partners we have at Anisio? Oh, this is a... A classic question, sort of, is it the horse or is it the jockey? You know, which one patters? And I, I think a great strategy isn't going to solve a isn't going to, to solve a, a very very mediocre pro- product at the end of the day. Uh, I think where, but what I think can happen is sort of the opposite. I think there are very good products that can fail if they're uh, can fail to achieve the maximal impact uh, in in this uh, oncology market if they don't have the right drive behind them or that it can take off longer than it otherwise should. I think as I, I referenced earlier, you know, when you look back over long periods of time, most of these medical innovations are going to find their way to the right hands. What biopharma organizations have the opportunity to do is to really do that faster, to make sure that if there are breakthroughs in therapy, that those get translated to clinical practice as soon as possible. And, you know, there are certainly... you takes 10 or 15 years, there's going to be many patients in those 10 or 15 years that get diagnosed and don't have an opportunity to vent through the treatment. So really what it's about is uh, how can you unlock that value? How can you uh, unlock the understanding and advance clinical practice as quickly as possible? I actually think I'm going to give you the same answer. It's in, uh, sort of artificial intelligence and data strategy. I think it's overhyped in the sense that it gets 
it gets used a lot as a buzzword without much content actually behind it. So everybody, I'm sure, is talking about data and AI solutions. Uh, it, I think it, it's an area where you can probably fake it till you make it in some ways. You know, there's a lot of reason which it gets it gets used to sort of cover up maybe what's happening or just gets added on top as opposed to really a thoughtful approach of how do you use uh, larger sets of data uh, and artificial intelligence as a way to mine that data to advance care to provide uh, advanced directives uh, I know there was a lot of hype even this weekend in terms of ASCO's collaboration with Google Gemini on their AI cancer uh, guideline tool um, and I'll be honest, the results were pretty mediocre in terms of what they were showcasing. Um, you know, there's some advances and it's clear, but there's also some failures to that. So there doesn't need to make sure there's a human in the loop at all times, uh, you know, certainly at this point in time. And how do you use artificial intelligence and wealth of data that we're great to amplify? You know, it, I think the the way to approach that or think about you know, whether a strategy is old uh, or just risky is, is really having a perspective for what you have to try to accomplish, right? You're trying to accomplish... Uh, something that is going to really advance the wall, that's really going to where it's advanced clinical of care, advanced business decision making, you know, then it's it potentially gonna be bold. If it's if it's only for the sake of being interesting, which we, we see it relates in some ways to whatever you speak around on the AI. But I think those strategies often are just are just risky. If there's not a clear focus, what are you trying to polish at the end of the day? Yo, that's a, a wonderful question. You know, we at Putnam uh, and Anisio overall, we work across you know every therapeutic area. We're here at the ASCO meeting, and uh, oncology is somewhat unique in that it is, and it's wonderful in this way that science and uh, clinical data really drive decision making. Uh, and so it, it really means that. You know, oncology, you know, we have to focus on having the right evidence, have it right data. That's what's going to drive decision making. Uh, in other therapeutic areas, obviously, clinical data matters at, uh, and influences, but it doesn't happen as fast as happens in, in the oncology arena. So that is, uh, you know, one of the interesting differences between oncology and other areas. I think probably uh, everyone here is we're here in ASCO on a Sunday is, is asking that question or we're thinking about that question. It's not an easy one. Uh, what I do think, though, is that by sort of having a uh, investing yourself in work, you get sort of the energy out of it and sort of pouring yourself into that. It can help energize other parts of your life and it's in the reverse is true. So for me, you know, the first thing and most important thing to me in my life is my family, my wife, my kids. Uh, and when I'm with them, I'm, I'm devoted to that. It gives me energy. It gives me the ability to really work hard at the, the life side of, of everything. And then uh, on the same end, and in the work that we do, it's, it's wonderful. It's fantastic. It gives me a lot of energy. So there's a lot that can get done in a day. Uh, I think when you're really energized, you enthused. So this is a curveball question, but if uh, I were to think here at in the ecology community, I think it starts with, uh, you know, to me, that we're all maladies. Uh, that was, is a, obviously a history of cancer uh, is, is, a, is a great starting point and it sort of provides a, a wonderful background and sort of the evolution of thought and understanding around cancer. Uh, and then another book that I would, consider uh which would be related to the, the theme here at, at asco is uh, endurance about the the shot that's an expedition to uh the antarctic and sort of being able to cry to come uh through against incredible odds and i think that that's what uh that's what organizations here are often doing in terms of developing drugs you know, honestly the, the chances of an individual with drug making it from preclinical into helping patients is pretty astronomical i'll be pushed forward on it anyway um, but more importantly the the human stories the patient stories of those that are are sort of fighting against cancer and the sort of becoming amazing odds with the help of, of medicines being developed today. So those are two of the recommendations. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe to Onka Daily on YouTube. Hit the bell icon to stay updated.